Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and it's been a couple weeks since Hurricane Ida slammed into southeast Louisiana, packing 150 mile an hour sustained winds, dropping over two feet of rain in spots, and leaving nearly a quarter of the state without power. And that's before we talk about the flooding rains that drenched a stretch of the United States from Mississippi to New England. So as communities from Cutoff to Covington pick up the pieces and the National Weather Service continue their post-storm assessments, let's take a look at the five big things to know about Hurricane Ida and how it's impacted the state and elsewhere. So first off, Ida joins Hurricane Laura from 2020 in the last island hurricane of 1856 as the strongest hurricane to make landfall in Louisiana in terms of wind speed with 150 mile an hour sustained so we use the criteria of air pressure at landfall, Ida's air pressure of 930 millibars was the second strongest storm to hit Louisiana, only behind Hurricane Katrina's 920 millibars when it passed over to Mississippi Delta in 2005. Now, like Ida, though, Katrina was in the process of weakening and its air pressure was actually rapidly rising at the time. Ida plowed through southeast Louisiana over the course of the day and into the evening of the 29th of August, starting with landfall at Port Fouchon, packing wind gusts of up to 172 miles per hour there. And to the east at Grand Isle, the anemometer on the island recorded a gust of 148 before it failed. All structures on the island received some damage, and the immediate aerial footage of the island showed feet of sand being deposited by the storm surge. So from there, Ida moved up the bayou near Homa and Thibodeau, ripping roofs off and flattening houses, and passed just to the west of New Orleans, causing the unique issue of storm surge from Lake Pontchartrain moving south into St. John the Baptist Parish, inundating the city of Laplace and surrounding areas. So by the time Ida had weakened to a tropical storm, it was on its way out of the state, leaving a soggy and trash trail of destruction in its wake, with even the Florida parishes receiving hurricane force winds and flooded rivers. Speaking of destruction, fact number two is that one of the most mind-blowing evidences of damage from Ida was the fact that all eight of the major electrical transmission lines that provided power to New Orleans were knocked out, including the transmission lines that crossed the Mississippi River near Avondale, as well as the subsequent power losses causing the controlled shutdown of the Waterford nuclear power plant west of the city. So even ignoring all of the damage in New Orleans, the loss of the transmission lines put everyone in the dark, and it was a pretty visceral reminder of the power of a hurricane. So while six of the eight lines have been brought back up at the time that I recorded this, allowing the chunk of the New Orleans metro area to get their lights back on within a week of the storm striking, the damage of these transmission lines show an important risk management concept known as the Swiss cheese principle. So electrical infrastructure contains a large number of safeguards and redundancies to keep the vital components in service. Even if one fails, there's other safeguards that keep a complete failure from occurring. However, sometimes the gaps in these layers of protection align like the holes and slices of Swiss cheese and a major failure occurs. So needless to say though, a 150 mile an hour hurricane arriving at New Orleans' doorstep would be the kind of thing that would cause the Swiss cheese slices to align, if you will. If there's a silver lining to this, the damage to the transmission lines will cause a rethink of how electrical power is delivered to New Orleans hopefully leading to an even more robust power grid that would survive a similar or perhaps even worse hurricane strike for the city in the future. Fact number three is with billions of dollars sunk into the post-Katrina levee systems for New Orleans, as well as the storm damage risk reduction system levees in Southern Lafourche Parish, Ida left local residents holding their breath to see if the levees would hold. Now, by the time the storm passed and people looked outside their homes, there was a collective sigh of relief that apart from local levee breaches outside the major federal systems, the earthen walls and floodgates met the challenge of a category four hurricane striking, meaning a second Katrina disaster was not going to occur this time. Now, while Ida was a success for the levees, they still have major systemic issues that do not guarantee future success, such as increasing rate of sea level rise, rapid sinking or subsidence of the land the levees stand on, not to mention the biggest risk of them all, the continued disappearance of coastline due to coastal erosion and the storm surge buffer that the coastline gives. Also related to all of this was the inundation, like I mentioned earlier, of St. John the Baptist Parish, with storm surge from Lake Pontchartrain coming ashore, causing the closure of I-10 outside of New Orleans and flooding Laplace and the surrounding area. Now, while the Army Corps of Engineers does have plans for extending levee protection in these communities to prevent this from happening again, the construction process only went out for bids in early 2021, meaning it will be years before it's complete. There might be light at the end of the tunnel for protection from a similar event in the future, 
but it's a small solace for those placing their soggy belongings at the side of the road for the second time in a decade after Hurricane Isaac flooded them in 2012. So fact number four is my little spicy fact, and it isn't even related to Louisiana. Rather, it's related to the images seen as the remnants of Ida swamping the northeast with flooding rains, culminating with the first ever flash flood emergency issued for the city. So now that people in Brooklyn are dealing with flooding like their counterparts in Bayou Blue and Bogalusa, perhaps it's time that residents in the communities of the northeast consider strategies to mitigate damage from remnant tropical systems or even the tropical tropical systems themselves. The value of a serious commitment to reducing risk to life and property from hurricanes was evident by the fact that I'd only caused eight direct deaths in Louisiana when it was at its strongest, while the weaker remnants of the storm killed nearly 20 people in New York state alone. Now yes, I know, the remnants of Ida were stronger than what the Northeast might usually face, but in the past 10 years, you've seen 10 storms hit the region, including a direct hit by Hurricane Irene in 2011 and Sandy a year later, meaning that the threat of tropical systems impacting the region are serious enough to consider mitigation strategies for cities and individuals. Finally, the fact is while Ida is gone, the recovery is just beginning. For instance, Terrebonne and Lafourche Parish is probably Probably won't see electricity until the end of September at the latest. Grand Isle is still considered uninhabitable, and well over a million residents are beginning the arduous process of filling out insurance and FEMA paperwork and, a getting, and attempting to get their lives back to something near to what it was only weeks ago. Even a year after Laura, Lake Charles shows the scars of uh, the storm's wrath, and traveling to Cameron Parish this summer showed that in communities closest to Laura's landfall, cleanup is still not complete, with some people just cutting their losses, leaving memorials to how Mother Nature ravaged their lives. And if you've watched my series on Louisiana hurricanes, you know that while the people of Louisiana do have a great deal of resiliency in the face of hurricanes, and they are willing to rebuild what was flattened, there will always be reminders of people who weren't able to put their lives together and were forced to move on. And once things settle down and access opens down to the southeast in the fall, I'll be heading down there to show you not just the aftermath of the storm, but also how recovery is going along. So I hope you enjoyed this real short video, and if you wanted to see more content like this, please subscribe to my channel and check it out. I've got plenty of videos about the science of hurricanes, as well as my series on the history of Louisiana hurricanes as well. But I'm not just a hurricane-only channel. I got lots of videos and other topics. If you have any questions, please put them in the comments below, and thanks for watching.